Hello, uh, we'll talk now about a phenomenon uh, that is uh, big, Bjarke Ingels group. What a nice coincidence now that the initials of his name with a G at the end became big. But maybe we need these days more uh, architecture practice where the combination between initials and maybe some other letters will generate small, not big. But Ingels, just like uh, his... Uh, uh, inspiring force, Rem Kolhas aspired towards a metropolitan architecture. Now, let's not forget, uh, Rem Kolhas uh, named his office OMA, no? the Office of Metropolitan Architecture. That is bigness. And now we have Ingels from a smaller country than, uh, than uh, um, the Netherlands, also advocating uh, bigness through the very name of his office. Anyway, Let's, uh, let's uh, start by looking at some uh, quotations from Bjarke Ingels. For me, architecture is the means, not the end. It's a means of making different life forms possible. Yeah, we could uh, agree. Uh, architecture is about trying to make the world a little more like our dreams. Um, he's not very spectacular in his uh, uh, quotations. Um, but but I think he's correct. If we could make architecture uh, uh, in such a way that, that, that our, our dreams would become possible through our architecture, it would be probably a nice thing, no? Architects dislike building their own homes because they have no client to blame but themselves. Uh, let's, let's see here. In the big picture, architecture is the art and science of making sure that our cities and buildings fit with the way we want to live our lives. Uh, again, not a very poetical and uh, surprising statement, but not everything that uh, needs to be surprising, I guess. So let's, uh, let's see if he says something else in this uh, 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 collection of, of thoughts of Bjarke Ingels. Architects have to become designers of ecosystems, not just designers of beautiful facades or beautiful sculptures, but systems of economy and ecology where we channel the flow, not only of people, but also the flow of resources through our cities and buildings. The villages are not mentioned, but the world, the world system is. And I think uh, we should be careful with this word system. As the singer of the group uh, Imagine Dragon said, the systems come and go, but the sun is still there. Uh, I know there is an obsession with systems, and I see Bjarke Ingels has it too, but the system uh, is not enough. For example, which is the system of Carlos Carpas architecture? Again, Bjarke Ingels, the notion that sustainability needs to sacrifice quality of life is a flawed one. It's a design challenge, a challenge to build something that transforms the idea of sustainability into something that will increase the quality of life for all those around it. Well, he is a hedonist. He declared it, that, you know, he, he, he wouldn't give up, you know, certain pleasures just because we need to become sustainable. But I'm not so sure that without some, some you know, uh, sacrifices, it, it is possible to continue. I'm not sure. Uh, I, I am, I'm a skeptical that, uh, you know, our assault on, on Earth uh, will, uh, in the name of our well-being, that is the well-being of human beings, uh, will, uh, will benefit uh, the planet. This I like, yes is more. Yes, perhaps yes is more, but there is also a place for no. You know, I mean, uh, should we say yes to the war in Ukraine? Just because yes is more? No, sometimes we have to say no. Sometimes no is more. So a no, uh, a vital, a vigorous no against war is more. For me, architecture is the means, I read this one already, sustainability is unappealing if it's always portrayed as something negative, a form of moral self-denial. 
an ethical dilemma, a moral sacrifice, a political dilemma, or a philanthropic donation. We are changing the angle and saying that sustainable cities can be a way of improving our quality of life. Yeah, but uh, how exactly to do it when you know that there are hundreds of millions of people living under the poverty line? Maybe, maybe uh, billions. I almost never listen to the radio. This is amusing because who is listening to the radio these days? I mean, I do, but I am an anachronist. Uh, it's interesting that he mentions the radio. It's actually very funny. I almost never listen to the radio. If he would have made this statement at the beginning of the 20th century, I would have understood. But at the beginning of the 21st century, I don't have to come up with the best idea. It is my job to make sure that it is always the best idea that wins. Okay. Um, uh, this one we read about. So let's look at some drawings. Here is Bjarke Ingels drawing uh, on a, some kind of a horizontal wall on, a, I don't know, or such a huge piece of paper. Anyway, he loves architecture. He loves himself. And uh, that's it. And it's true, his, uh, his success is astonishing. If by success we mean uh, the ability to, 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 to build such, such buildings in such a short time. Architect Bjarke Ingels has a blueprint to rescue humanity. Well, he has this way of um, conceptualizing uh, that is very easy to comprehend, but I'm not so sure it's so um, accurate. You know, very often he says A plus B equals C. We are going to see many examples like this. And here we see, you know, the the blueprint for saving the planet. Well, if things would be so simple, no, it would be very, very nice. Um, the master planet product of, you know, it's it's an it's a rather shallow optimism, in my opinion. But it's good to be optimistic. Yes, it's good to be you know, vigorous, to have uh, vitality, to, to, to work in the name of, yes, it's good, but life is complex. You know, it, things are not so... Anyway, he's a showman too, a successful one, a man who draws, uh, you know, as he does. I, I think his drawings are very different from the drawings of Bernini or Michelangelo or uh, even, uh, even Tom Main, for that matter, uh, who, who, who draws much more lyrically. But uh, this uh, young man is able to, to build uh, as, as no one else almost in, in the whole world. And uh, as I mentioned, his, um, his uh, pro procedural uh, way of, uh, of conceptualizing. You see, we see the prism, the rectangular prism on the left. Then we see a horizontal prism with a courtyard on the right. So A plus B equals C. And that's how he got the building that was built in New York City. Most architects, if they would build just this building, would be very, very happy at the end of a long life. And he built many. Or again, you know, with these arrows, he's uh, um, arriving at uh, so-called logical conclusions very, very quickly. Like here, the Tirana grid, the Mecca orientation, and we have the new mosque of Tirana. I think, are, I don't think so very easy. For uh, uh, for this lover of Lego, yes, they are. Orcus, look, apartment buildings built. At least, I mean, they are almost exasperatingly simplistic. But but they because because he always finds a way to introduce a certain disturbance. In this case, the diagonal, the diagonal, the triangle. Of course, he doesn't think about the apartment here, which is very possible and receives no sunlight at all and might even have problems with intimacy because of the proximity to the other apartments on the other side. You know, there is always such a Achilles uh, ankle uh, in, in his projects. You know, they look luminous and clear, maybe too clear, but you see here that there are problems. Now, Architecture cannot avoid problems forever and completely. I understand this. But certain things, if you assume the complexities of life, uh, you could uh, negotiate and you could uh, compromise and you can 
No, no, I, I don't want to be mis misunderstood. I, I, I don't advocate in any way compromise. But it's just that things are not so simple. Uh, uh, look here in this project, there is uh, another housing complex here, which he didn't do, and which is in a way more interesting than what he did in Orcus. Um, he built a lot of uh, buildings like this. He, it is true, he has a, a, an incredible ability to convince almost anybody that he is right. And that's why uh, so many buildings, uh, you know, are, are built. And these two lovers here, you know, they contemplate his work uh, uh, while uh, being in love with each other. Anyway, the triangle again, the pyramid, the, but he also works with a spiral, uh, with, um, the, you know, with a DNA uh, spiraling, uh, you know, uh, um, yeah, with the, with the, with the twisting. So, he has he has a certain complexity in his simplicity. Now the watchflower is a is a project. Um, I don't think he built it. Is it was created as a three dimensional promenade that floats in the space above the harbor edge and the water dock in Orcus again in the harbor. This is the city where John Woodson was born. A 155 meters long sloping promenade meanders like a mountain pass designed with handicap accessibility, had clearance and statics in mind. The promenade takes shape as a flower, gradually growing from the concrete harbor edge towards the sky. Uh, to be honest with you, I would like flowers to look like flowers. I, I'm not sure I would, I would enjoy very much such so-called flowers. But this is his conception, you know, it's, uh, it doesn't have uh, an impressionist uh, painter's uh, sensibility uh, as a different kind of sensibility and uh, rather masculine and uh, uh, you know uh, assertive to the point of disturbance it's rather aggressive this so-called flower is it not well fortunately it was not built except as a model and we are going to see the maker of the model here he is <laughs> um Anyway, and here he is, the maker of the model working in his uh, shop, uh, Scum. This is uh, an unexpected, uh, should we call it structure, balloon, an inflated uh, structure for parties. Uh, Bjarke Inges love partying and loves, uh, uh, you know, uh, hedonic, hedonistic ways of being in the world. It is this too, I, you even wonder, you know, how, I mean, he probably has at this very moment uh, 50 major projects in his office, if not 100. Um, I mean, major projects. This is just like, a, you know, uh, an essay in, uh, in significance compared to the large, uh, you know, buildings he built. Uh, all over the world. I thought of including it in the presentation. B completes pair of twisting towers in Miami's coconut grove. Yes, they are twisting. They, he loves to twist and he benefited from a very good Italian-American engineer here who did this uh, twisting. And then, of course, came Ken Gokuma, who almost copied uh, um, BRK Ingels and uh, created also a twisted tower very similar to what uh, BRK Ingels did before him here in Miami. Uh, this uh, Kengo Kuma, with all due respect, sometimes uh, is uh, inspiring himself from other people, from Zaha Hadid too, from BRK Ingels. Now look at him. Any nostalgic, melancholy architect would hate this picture because this is a man who did it, who does it, who doesn't seem to have, uh, you know, uh, too much angst. He has all the commissions in the world and he, <laughs> he, he still is probably a charming, a charming fellow, an engineer from the United States who, a uh, very important engineer, Mahadev Rahman, who worked once with the Archangels, told me that at a conference, about one of his projects, uh, this man seduced any lady in the in the room. You know, there were 
he's he's a you know a charming fellow and he 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 charms uh, you know clients and uh, so on is that he maybe not you know again a large uh, balcony where 100 people can party that's him right there you know at the end of this very long uh, exterior um, corridor well actually a balcony in miami uh, of course, a lot of, I mean, these, these apartments are for millionaires, you know, I mean, look, covered in the marble and uh, very fine uh, details. Uh, here he is again visiting the, you know, seeing the swimming pool at the top uh, of the building. The pool is surrounded by stone with a fossilized coral relief. Very nice. I mean, this in itself is an artwork. So obviously he has good taste, he's a good, uh, has a good sense of design. And, you know, people can enjoy themselves in such a, um, you know, opulent uh, environment, uh, rather grayish here and cold. And here he is with a, with a developer. They made a lot of money with these buildings. On the left, the developer, on the right, the architect. Doing well, the Twist Bridge Museum at Kista, Kista Post, Art Park in Norway, you know it. Now, look again at his scheme. The building museum, as in generally is, let's say. Then the infrastructure, the bridge, plus the bridge, plus the art sculpture, which is, you know, conceptualized formally in this way. He thinks generates what to look at the art bridge. It's very simplistic, but it is seductive. He got the commission. Bridging art and nature, and here it is. It's built just like this. Not bad that he is not quite correct about what he says there, because nature is not opposed to art. In fact, art, I mean, art is not so opposed to nature. In fact, it inspires itself from nature. But the way he puts it here, you know, you have the prism on the left, and you have a bridge which has to be he thinks in that way. And then the art is some kind of a, an extravagance, a formal extravagance. Now, why exactly, if we add these three things, we get this? I guess the art is um, responsible for the twisting. But the building is built. And it's built impeccably in Norway. And uh, we'll see the architect uh, trying to get more commissions, like here. Look at him. He is uh, telling those people, maybe politicians, investors, clients, and so on, you know, come to me. We'll, we'll build such things more and more and more often. We can do it. And he can. Look, it was built. Oh, I don't know. The interior, it is as it is. But as you can see, he uses a system, a clearly defined conceptual system, and then he brings in some kind of a disturbance, a difference, a difference, a twisting, in this case, a twisting. But on the other hand, he also worked for social housing. And I appreciate him for this and I applaud him for this. Hopes for all. Okay, not too much twisting here, but I would be very happy to live in such an apartment, which is done for those without privileges, you know, so-called... Uh, social housing for the, you know, homes for all. Very, very nice that Bjarke Ingers, despite the fact that he works very well with billionaires and millionaires, he also thinks of those less privileged. This is very nice. And I think many architects should do this. Never forget those who do not have privileges. Uh, where is this? It's, I think it's in Copenhagen. Yes. This can be seen in Copenhagen, this building. It's less spectacular than some other buildings by him, but it's still well executed. And you can still see the lover of Lego in this building as well. Bjarke Ingels, Copenhagen, Denmark. Building for all. Homes for all. No, I wouldn't mind at all living in such an apartment. A little bit uh, too obvious the system, the formal system he used, but uh, 
it's built. And look, <laughs> you know, it makes me laugh because because things are so simple for the archangel. So uh, he, he doesn't seem to have doubts. And this is strange because he's a Dane, no? And Hamlet was a Dane, was a Danish prince. The prince of doubting, no? Hamlet. Well, the archangels doesn't seem to have doubts. What is this? Residence is in Taiwan. He only built this uh, segment. Uh, it was supposed to be larger, and we are going to see it. By the time I, I made this PowerPoint presentation, it was supposed to be like this. But uh, by the time I made uh, this PowerPoint point presentation, he only built these five uh, uh, triangular mounds, or I don't know how to call them. A little bit uh, schematic, uh, this so-called uh, natural, uh, you know, architectural uh, uh, visions. They are schematic, but they are at least not those uh, common, uh, you know, block of flats that are flat at the top and flat everywhere. But they are schematic, it's true, and rather... Um, uh, I mean, in, in nature, things are different. Anyway, it was not built like this. We only saw the, the five uh, units that were built in Taiwan. But it's clear that nature comes back to architecture in uh, more and more obvious ways. And there are other architects. We saw a project um, also done for Taiwan by Mario Bellini, kind of very similar to this. Well, considering that his plan is to rescue the planet before Elon Musk takes us to the to Mars, uh, you know his his attempt is, uh, I guess, positive. Now the Copen Hill power plant in Copenhagen, Copenhagen by by Big, uh, yes, why not have a, a sloping uh, uh, activity on the top of uh, of, of the building? A skiing on top of the building could add a, a ludic dimension to, uh, you know, uh, an industrial building because that's what it is, an industrial building. This is in Copenhagen and those who have a chance to visit Copenhagen should see it. But here we see again the, the, this articulation of small parts creating the whole, which is rather predictable. There is a system. But he also betrays the system, just like this uh, young person, I imagine young, uh, you know, throws himself into the water in that uh, spectacular way. And we see, the, you know, the, the artistic side of the Archangels in the, in the landscaping uh, uh, or the planning of, of what's going on on the roof of this uh, industrial building. And the Danes uh, love it, you know. They, I mean, how many factories or industrial buildings are in the world where you can ski on top of them? Not many. And the world's tallest climbing wall is being added to a Bjarke Ingels design sustainable power plant, the power plant that we saw. And here, here is uh, maybe an echo coming from, uh, I don't know, Frank Gehry. Uh, but it's transformed in a hedonistic way into, a, into the world's tallest climbing wall, which was added to the building later. Why not? Anything is possible. Now you see it here. So this, this man devours architecture and architecture devours him. <laughs> and that's nice. There is passion. There is clearly total dedication to architecture. And you see here even turning against architecture. Because who would have thought of climbing, let's say, the Parthen? Nobody. But, well, okay, this is not the Parthenon. But it's still a building of an ambitious architect who wants to make every building special. Like the Vancouver House in Canada, um, a total work of art. Think of Vancouver House as a giant curtain at the moment of being pulled back to reveal the world of Vancouver and Vancouver to the world. That's what he said. And, uh, you know, the master of, uh, 
uh, getting inspired by other people, Kengo Kuma found the inspiration in this building too, and he built also in Vancouver a building that uh, in many ways is similar to this one. And after uh, the Archangels built his. Now, could we approximate that the building is a curtain that will then when moved could welcome people entering the city like he claims? Well, you know, a spectacular claim. And the tour de force in, in terms of structure, yes. Uh, but uh, again, it was built. It was built. So obviously it's possible. And uh, it's, I don't know, I, I have my own ideas about what justifies uh, or explains uh, the, this uh, deformation of the building. It is, I guess, uh, you know, uh, an intrinsic uh, rebelliousness from an architect who understands that you cannot practice any art, including architecture, without also betraying certain things, being rebellious. Uh, what is this uh, in Malaysia? This big and, uh, I don't know, other people win international competition to design a master plan for Penang, South Island, Malaysia. I'm not going to read this uh, uh, now. It's a bio biodiversity city. And as you can see, the human beings attack, attack nature more and more and more and more. And, uh, you know, in the name of a hedonistic sustainability, everything is fine here. Everything is clean. Everything is colorful. We wonder who works. Nobody works. Everybody is enjoying the street and the opulence and the, the, the nature. And so it's, it's paradise on earth, right? But we know very well that that's not how life is. You know, you say, gun is pollution, gun is suffering, gun is, uh, you know, unpleasant work. Uh, <laughs> we know that it's not like this. Some people have to labor hard in order to, to have just a fragment of what uh, Bjarke Ingels and his partners depict here, you know? Uh, when you look at this image, you'll say life is beautiful on us. No, it's absolutely beautiful. Well, it could be beautiful sometimes, but it could be also a pain other times. And we know that. Maybe in Bjarke Ingels too, he's just not telling us this. Everything, you know, and look, you look at this image and you say, come on, is this the result of being banished from the paradise? It looks more like being banished to the paradise, not from the paradise. And many, many people on this earth, uh, you know, billions of people that need to be happy in the name of a hedonism that is, in my opinion, a little bit questionable. And the sky is clean, of course, it doesn't even rain. There are no clouds. It's blue and it's splendid and the water is, is pristine, is absolutely clean. There is no garbage and the, and the nature is triumphantly happy itself and and what <laughs> this is not how life is or at least not how i know it and i'm not uh, unable to uh, dream but uh, again hamlet is missing the man of the prince of doubts or doubting is missing here it looks yes it would be nice no but we read uh, recently that uh, uh, Venice is uh, now charging a ticket in order to enter the city because the city is suffocated by tourism. Well, maybe, maybe this kind of uh, you know urban planning on the water would uh, confront some problems as well. The latest architecture news: Bjarke Ingels Group Big Designs AI City, an innovation campus hosting headquarters of tech firm. Where else in China? Uh, the AI City, the future home for Terminus Group, a smart service provider, imagined as the new center of innovation for China. The project will be dedicated to, I quote, artificial intelligence, robotics, networking, and big data. Big data and big in a nice conjunction. Located in this place in China, known as the Mountain City, the project is set within the <laughs> You read it, industrial development zone. Okay, so here it is. 
with uh, some nature on top, of course. And then we have uh, convexities and concavities and splendid trees. And uh, again, happiness can be found on this earth and even uh, the paradisiacal condition. Adam and Eve would uh, return to a paradise where the archangels and big completed the work of God. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, I mean, really, who is working here? They, everybody is a visitor, you know. They are visiting. We are visiting the earth, actually. And we see the two sides, you know, with the, uh, I think there is a scheme. Let me see if I remember. Yeah, here it is. The mountain and the valley. The mountains plus the mountain plus the valley in ki some kind of a yin and yang. Well, they complement each other here. You can see it. Uh, it's rather shallow, you know. I mean, is that truly a valley? And is this truly a mountain? Not really. But, you know, at a certain level of titillation, I guess it's possible. Mountain plus valley. The park and the building, the nature and architecture, dualities, but these dualities in nature and artificial intelligence. Ah, I'm a little bit tired of these uh, schematics and arrows, of course, we need to have arrows, uh, you know, vectors to, to, to show, you know, that we are in control, that the processes of life are under the control of the architect and the uh, you know, the visionaries. Big Sun conventional Uppsala power plant designed to host summer festivals. Uh, let's see what's here. Uh, home to Scandinavia's oldest university and landmark uh, Uppsala Cathedral, the plant proposes, proposes biggest challenge was to respect the city's historic, um, historic uh, skyline Considering the project's proposal, this was not built. Big envisioned a dual-use power plant. He seems to be interested in these power plants that transcends the public perception. In the summer months, the crystalline proposal was designed to transform into a venue for festivals during the peak of tourism. And here it is, you know, some kind of a geodesic dome of large uh, dimensions. Um, I guess, I, I, I don't know. I love those shells longs, old fashioned as they are. A lot of glass, meaning a lot of uh, energy consumption. Someone has to pay the bills. And we see in the, in the, in the, in the background, the, the cathedral and in the foreground, the power plant. Again, arrows is the man of concept, clearly. Uh, it was not built. It looks simple, but it was not built. Now, the Google headquarters where he worked together with Thomas Heatherwick was built. Here they are, the two of them, the genius from Denmark and the genius from Great Britain. Um, do you see the, the huge trucks, how small they are? I mean, the building is huge. But for Google, of course, the appropriate, um, the appropriate building. Now, bigger NASA collaborate to design 3D printed buildings for the moon. Why are we living to the moon? Because we ravage the Earth, that's why. Big and 3D printed building company Icon have revealed they are working on Project Olympus. <laughs> Still with nostalgia, no, for Greece, which aims to develop robotic construction for the moon. The architecture firm and search were enlisted for the project by Icon after it received a small business innovation research annual called Project Olympus. It aims to develop a way to create a 3D printed infrastructure for living on the moon using materials found on its surface. I don't know. I mean, there are projects also for Mars. 
Oh, why would we go to Mars and to Moon when the Earth is truly very beautiful if we only take care of it? But we don't. Anyway, the Archangels on the Moon. And then, uh, interesting. Uh, um, my question is, why not use the, the vision and the imagination that we put into envisioning things for Mars or for Moon on Earth? Let's imagine that we came from Mars to the Earth instead of the other way around. Because when I look at this picture, I realize I cannot ride a bicycle in shorts on the moon, nor can I do this on Mars. But on Earth, it's possible. Not that this is the goal of life, to run on a bike in shorts in the summer. But thank you.